Good morning. It is time to start. Welcome to the forum. It's always interesting to discover who lives in our community and who chose to live in our community. And today we're going to meet two award-winning entrepreneurs who definitely made that choice deliberately and um, with some research. First is Billy Goat Hop Farm. Chris is not here today, but Chris Della Bianca and Audrey Gelhausen traveled through five states looking for visiting distributors, breweries, farms, and real estate looking for a place to locate a hot pot. And after a lot of research, they decided Montrose would be that place. And I think we all noticed it because these strange structures were going up south of town and we thought, what in the world is that? And it was their hop farm. And they made a great choice because on their 32 trellis acres, which is the biggest hop farm in the Southwest, they have created the first place winner of the 2023 Hop Quality Group Cascade Cup Hops, <laughs> and they were named the best Cascade Hops in the country the first time that has ever happened outside the state of Washington and Oregon. So good choice, um, interesting product, and it will be fun to hear from Audrey. Our second speaker is Jonathan, tell me how to say your last name. Ballesteros. Ballesteros inventor, founder, CEO of Geyser Systems. Um, Jonathan has kind of <coughs> dedicated his life to saving water one drop at a time. And he put his design and medical engineering skills to work after countless days, weeks, months of sleepless nights to create the geyser system. It is the highest rated portable hot shower system in the REI co-op. He's been um, touted receiving stellar reviews in Backpacker Outside and Continents magazines. And in 2022, Jonathan won the Colorado Manufacturing Awards Innovative Project of the Year Award. And um, so both of these people come being award winners, being entrepreneurs, stepping outside the box, and it will be really fun to hear what they have to say. So the way we're gonna do this is Audrey is going to speak first. And then when she's finished, Jonathan will speak. When he's finished, we'll go to Q&A. And when we do Q&A, they will both come up and you can address your questions to either of them. So Audrey, welcome. I, I, I think she said it all. I don't know what else I have to say. <laughs> Um, and I have to apologize, we have just started harvest, and so I am a little ill-prepared, um, but I'm pretty good at rambling, so. Um, Chris and I, um, I originally grew up in Indiana, and Chris grew up in Connecticut, and then we met on a chairlift skiing in Jackson Hole, and we spent about a decade um, living the seasonal lifestyle, river guiding, ski bumming, um, you name the seasonal job, we probably had it. And it was a lot of fun, but we got tired of uh, living in a van and, and you know bouncing around job to job and decided we wanted to own our own business and, and, and do something for our future. And so we looked into a lot of different options from Airbnbs and restaurants, landscaping companies. Um, we both really enjoyed uh, good beer 
and we both liked working and being outside. Chris had um, a background working with plants. He grew up doing a lot of turf maintenance on golf courses and in landscaping care and, and working with plants in that way. And so in um, 2015, 2016, uh, we were both working in breweries up in the Teton area and there was a shortage of hops. And so that started Chris's mind going of, oh, prices are rising on hops. This is an interesting you know, way to be outside, get back playing with plants. And so we started researching online, looking more into what that even, what does it even look like? We didn't even know how they grew, what the plant looked like, anything about it other than like, you know, it's in a beer. It looks like a little green thing on the picture of the beer bottle. Um, and so Chris uh, got a year long internship at a big 800 acre hop farm in Southern Idaho. Um, and for a really good grower up there and learned all the processes, um, saw from, from planting rhizomes to harvest um, and checked it all out. I was able to um, come down for a few weeks and see it as well. And at the end of that season, it was sort of like, all right, we're gonna do it or not, you know, like, uh, here we go. So we decided, yep, we're gonna go for it, but where do you start it? And um, as she mentioned, we loaded back up in the van and we did a three month road trip through five different states, um, meeting other farmers, <clears throat> breweries. Um, the, yeah, the gamut we looked at, of course, you know, climate and weather. When do you get your first freeze, your last freeze? Um, how many brewers are there? What's the community like? Um, and, and not only is what is the place like for the business and for sales, but also for us, um, it was a really difficult decision. Uh, to leave the mountains and to leave that, you know, the rivers and, and the wilderness in that respect um, and come down to the flatland. Um, so that was a big part of our decision as well. And we ended up picking Montrose because there were some other farms in the area growing, so we knew um, we wouldn't be totally the first people doing it. Um, there's a lot of breweries in the state and in the area, and in general, Colorado cares about Colorado grown or produced ingredients, uh, Colorado Proud. And, um, and also, I don't know another agricultural area that in 45 minutes you can be at 11,000 feet and um, playing in the mountains and still have you know your tractor store and your irrigation supply and all the things that you need right around you. So it all sort of aligned for us. And then, um, yeah, January 2017, we came to Montrose, found a little room to rent south of town, and um, spent about two months looking for property, and actually went uh, on a run one afternoon and saw a for sale by owner sign on some property, and that um, we're down south of town on Trout Road. Um, that it evolved into, it was, in, it was an alfalfa field when we started, and um, we put up uh, 32 acres of trellis, which is over 2,300 poles, 57 miles of cable, uh, 352 dead men, concrete at three and a half feet in the ground. Wow. And if I never pick up a 16 pound pry bar again in my life, I will be happy. <laughs> it was a lot more digging than I expected. Um, a lot of rocks. But um, uh, we built a warehouse, um, and are still, I feel like every year, figuring out the equipment and acquiring uh, the proper machinery, it, um, it takes a lot of processing from getting it down, getting the hops off the vine, um, and then you dry it down to 10% moisture content or lower, <clears throat> then you bale it all, then those bales need to go in cold storage. Once the entire field is down, separated, dried, and baled in cold storage, then we switch all of our machines around. Um, and pelletize it all. So on the harvesting side, they don't, most farms, the hop farms are, you know, if you're a 500 acre farm, you're small. Um, and that's Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, where 99.9% .9 of all hops in the US are grown. Um, and they have, I mean, their picker machine costs more than our entire farm. They're massive operations. Um, so there's not very many smaller operations in existence in, in, in anywhere. Um, so our equipment all came over from Germany. Um, our pickers in 1973. So you can imagine working on that, how much fun that is. 
there's not exactly a guy down the road that works on those. So every step of the way, you're learning how to fix it, how to, I didn't realize you have to become, you know, uh, an HVAC person, an electrician, a mechanic, uh, you know, you name it, a welder. Um, it, it's very encompassing. I'm sure some of you have done some farming and are like, duh. But um, yeah, we figured that out. And so, um, yeah, then the dryer is a big uh, three meter by three meter box and it blows hot forced air up and there's louvered floors that those floors all came over from Germany as well. Um, and, and drop down and dry as they come to a big drawer that pulls out and drop them into a hopper and lots of conveyor belts and um, a lot of the trailers and equipment is all custom made you know you got to find find a person that knows how to design and weld and and tell me what what you want so it's a huge process of getting all that equipment and keeping it working and then when you switch to the pelletizing side um, you know you need a hammer mill and a surge tank and and more conveyor belts to get it from one to the other and you're, you're breaking it down into a powder and you're squishing it into a little pellet and then you have to cool them and package them. And so um, there's a lot of that side going on. And, um, and then we sell them. Um, we do all of our own marketing and sales direct to breweries, um, which has been a little harder than expected. Um, there certainly are a lot of folks that are interested, but I think there is a mentality that when you go to drink a craft beer, you are supporting a small business and, and you're, you're sort of helping the, the, the team out, uh, which is true, but you don't typically think where are the ingredients in this beer coming from. And so if that brewery or brewer does not have this push from his customer base saying, hey, I want local ingredients in my beer, they, they don't totally have the drive. They're busy running their own business and trying to make their ends meet. And so um, putting a little extra effort in to, to buy local um, is an extra step and they have to really care themselves to make that decision and we have to tell them to care. <laughs> um, so that's, that's been um, a little bit of a hurdle that I didn't expect. Um, but every year we get more folks on board. Every year we are in, you know, in with more breweries and more beers, which is exciting. And um, yeah, and ship them out and, and yeah. And, that's good. I would say the only other kind of main difficulty other than all the equipment and sales is labor has, has increasingly been more difficult to find, especially working um, in, in a real labor position. You know, it's hard work um, and the plants can be itchy and scratchy and it's hot outside. And um, so that's been another hurdle that we, as we go into harvest, we're gonna constantly work with already <coughs> Yesterday um, was the first day, and three people that were, you know, we talked to a dozen times, supposed to be there, were no show, no calls. Mm -hmm. And so then you're, you know, scrap it, and that's just day one. And that'll probably happen, you know, every fourth day. We'll have somebody not come again, and we'll have to go try and find more people. And then we'll just kind of limp through as far as the harvest side, or as far as the labor side goes through harvest and, um, and make it work. But, it's been uh, interesting, especially since the, the pandemic, finding folks that want to come out. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, that's all I'll say for now, and I'll pass it on over to John. Thank you, Audrey. Um, all right, great. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm the founder and CEO of Geyser Systems. I'm also the inventor. And like Audrey, my story starts off with taking a nice long road trip. And uh, after designing advanced surgical instruments for 12 years for Stryker, for Smith and & Nephew, and doing some really Star trek -y stuff, I decided to take a break and live in the back of this van in the middle of Australia. And that's where the company really started. Um, I was set up on a blind date six months into the trip and I smelled like a burning dumpster and I literally had like that little bottle over there sitting on the desk I had like the tiniest amount of water left and I wasn't ready to get cleaned and it was a very recurring problem just I never had enough water to clean myself my dishes <coughs> cook 
And that's something that um, I later discovered and determined, you know what, that's a problem that a lot of people are facing when they go out camping. So I mean, how many of you love to be outside and love the outdoors? Yeah, so we all can relate after a third day of camping, it's getting kind of grimy. And so, but most importantly, it's there's just never enough water to do everything that you want to do outside. So I came up with this question, like, how can I make the most of every drop of water? And I, it, that question caused me to pause because I said, well, man, if I had the answer to that question, I could probably change the world. And yeah, um, everyone probably knows what this is, your solar shower bag. I used this, it broke, pain in the butt to hang, never hot enough, or maybe it's too hot, dribbles at the end. I tried this guy, foot pump, air pressurizes a uh, bag, and that always broke, because I would over pressurizing it, knowing that the last bit would always dribble. So here I am in this tool shed in Australia. No one has ever actually seen this picture before. I'm gonna share with you guys some things I've not shown before just to make it fun and interesting. Um, but um, yeah, I just got possessed by that question. Like how can I make the most of every drop of water? I don't want to say obsessed, I would say possessed because uh, it was almost out of moral obligation. Like I had to find an answer. I had to find a way to make some other option available in the world. <laughs> in parts of the world where water is a major issue. These are six months and six rounds of prototyping and uh, different heating elements, using a wet comb because um, I got a lot of feedback every round of prototyping. And um, you know, ladies wanna be able to clean their hair and so I had to figure out a way how to do that. And the first five rounds were using a foot pump similar to, to this guy, but I got really frustrated because like, like the problem that I faced with this one, I even reinforced PVC with more glue to stop the uh, leaks from overpressurizing the system. And so, I mean, you can kind of imagine, you know, like this is five months of work and on the fifth month, I'm, I take all of this and I just clear the table oh. and I'm like, no, this is not going to work. So I had to take a radically different approach. And um, I came up with this guy and introduced it to this community. Um, little did I know when I bought that vehicle that uh, buying the vehicle also means you get to join a cult. <laughs> so we all know like Harley Davidson drivers are like running around with you know, tattoos of Harley Davidson. It's like a brand that is like your part of something, you know, and they always wave each other, you know, on the on well, when you buy a Toyota Troop Carrier, it's a Land Cruiser version, um, you're part of the Harley Davidson of Australia. Like, <laughs> like the, the one thing I, I love about them but I cannot keep up with is number one, the amount of drinking that they do and the amount of fun that they have in the middle of nowhere because like these people were pulling me up mountains at places I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But this was, um, the first, so to speak, public release of the geyser, and uh, it's a really radical approach to every drop of water, and I'll show you a little bit more how, how that's done, but this is our first production order um, to a Facebook group, um, covered in neoprene just to keep it insulated and clean, and got some great feedback from that. People took it out through the Australian Outback, and you know, originally, you know, this is gonna be a Australian, so to speak, invention and company, but um, I guess I'll just cut down to the chase after all of that feedback, testing in the middle of nowhere, really rigorous conditions, corrosive conditions, um, landed us with this. So on the right hand side, you got a container where you take this lid up top, you put 0.8 gallons of water in there. That's enough to shower two people. That's 15 minutes of wash time. I'll let that sink in. How many gallons? 0.8. Yeah, that's, a, that's pretty disruptive. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you have a pump that operates like your heart. The more you need, the faster it'll pump. It gives consistent pressure, so we don't have an overpressurized system. 
Uh, we don't have also a dribbling, like, you know, the tail end of a shower bag. It's like there's nothing coming out. And instead of a shower head that's blowing water everywhere, we send water through a sponge. And that allows you to make the most of every drop of water exactly where you need it. So perfect pressure, direct dispersion. The patent has been approved in China, Australia, South Africa, Israel, and about to be in the United States. We had one last interview with the examiner. I will be celebrating for weeks when that day comes. <laughs> That's a pretty big, substantial statement and um, a large amount of territory that I think has a huge impact for the community. Because, I mean, this is not just a product. This is a patent talking about pumping and direct dispersion. Um, so this is an, an applicable technology for a variety of use cases, not just this one, and I'll explain that in a bit. Some of you might be a little skeptical. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have already seen this, but we'll have some fun. We'll do five gallons of mud and uh, five gallons of sunscreen, <laughs> four bags of holly powder. This is like an, an employee appreciation day. Like they had so much fun with their boss that day. And I clean all of that off with 20 gallons of water. It's really cool. Um, so if you could sum up our company, our team is on a mission to transform people's relationships to every drop of water. Our team includes manufacturing, marketing, customer service, refurbishing, 100% here in Montrose. And so far we've been kicking a lot of booty. Um, we've been a top rated product at REI after two and a half, three years of being on all shelves and all stores, which was a huge thing. Our advisors that I met at this accelerator program in Gunnison, an accelerator program meaning like they take small companies and they take them to the next level of growth. We got accepted into that program and it was focused on outdoor gear products. So we got introduced to a lot of leaders in the outdoor gear industry. When they found out that I was able to pitch to the REI buying team, they're like, look, dude, you're lucky if you're in top like 10 largest stores, like 35 stores is a stretch. And I'll never forget at the very end of the pitch, I told the buyer, I was like, so we have enough capacity for 1,200 units, how much of it do you want? No, 1,000 units. And he's like, I want 1,200 units in all stores, but next year, can you make that happen? And I said, yeah, we can. And there's only one other company in the country who was introduced to all stores at REI in their first year of launch. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty big honor and a big leap. Um, all, all systems go. And then REI took us even larger after they saw how we performed. Um, I want you to know, like, 357 reviews, that's a huge achievement. That's only for one model. We have another model with another 250 reviews. So we have over 600 reviews and we have 4.6 stars um, on average. That's a huge, huge achievement by this community. And I say this community because there's a lot of players that are behind us in this effort. And it's something that we can really be proud of, but it speaks to how much of a difference we're making for people and how much of a game changer this is and how much we stand behind our product, which is I think is one of the hallmark qualities about uh, people here in Montrose, like people really do care about what they create in the world. Uh, yeah, so these are the different products that we have right now available at REI. And um, last year we had a pretty big challenge. So um, I'll show you, this is the kind of growth that we've done since the inception and me living in the back of a van in 2016 and then the community and the players that got behind us. Um, I'll tell you how it ha how the story changes after 2021. You know, things did happen, and that was really fun and exciting. But um, I just want you guys to see, like, we are available. Really big channels. We're about to announce a huge channel um, retailer that we're about to be launched at. We're really excited. Uh, really, really excited. We are opening up in international channels, and we also support a lot of smaller shops, primarily in the overlanding industry. Um, our vision is this, you know, 
we want to address the water crisis in areas of the world that are really water stressed. And so, um, if you guys can imagine this technology being available to really make a difference for areas of the world, as well as people in our backyard, Southwest country, Southwest portion of our country. So, to fulfill that mission, we not only um, you know, established ourselves with an incredible brand in the outdoor gear segment, but we also created three more brands. And this is primarily a byproduct of, okay, well, wait a minute, the outdoor gear industry had a major pullback yet last year, and we had to find a way to diversify ourselves. And but we also were in demand. We were seeing problems and we were solving them. So I'm gonna guide you guys through a quick storyline of we're now providing a service at large camping events where we show up and shower thousands of people using our technology. It is awesome. We have a new product that is being uh, launched and allows people to save water at home. It can connect easily with uh, their showers. And then uh, without saying too much, we have been uh, working very closely with one of our branches and uh, addressing a real need to have uh, water out in the field and make things available for men and women in uniform. So our at-home division is one I'm really, I mean, I get super excited about all of this, but this is essentially a new product that we launched. It's a second gen version of the sponge. It's not sim It's not identical to the other one. There's a major couple of major features. Number one, I wanted this second gen sponge to be affordable for anyone around the world and super compressed so that it's super cheap to ship to a place like South Africa. Shipping being one of the big, biggest barriers for our first gen flagship product, despite the fact that people still buy it out there. But this is gonna be one that is like, I want the cheapest product so that there's like an absolute no brainer no matter what part of the world you're in. If you're in a developing country, you can still afford it. The price is not a barrier. It actually makes a lot of sense. So we achieved that with this. Um, and what's really cool about this product is two things. Number one, they're interchangeable, so the compressed cellulose expands with water. And then um, we have a really cool design that um, myself and one of our, he was an intern, he's now full time, but an 18 year old who loves to go climbing, inspired by cams that slip into rocks. He and I were coming up with a way to secure the cellulose with the tubing that shoots the water out inside. And so he and I co-invented this. His name is on the patent. That's one that we're really excited about getting approved. I'm feeling really good about because there's nothing, it's quite alien actually in the approach, which I like that. Um, and then we also have an opening here in the bottom um, that allows us to put some things in. So this is something that I was like, holy cow, you guys have got to try. Like, Aromatherapy is probably an understatement. <laughs> um, your whole house is gonna smell amazing after you take a shower because I mean, this is, essential oil is so intense, you cannot directly apply it in your skin, but the sponge provides now a barrier so that you can actually wash yourself. And man, like for a person who lost his sense of smell after COVID, like this is an awakening. Like there's few things that come close to a cup of coffee for me. I love coffee. This is right up there next to coffee. Like I have to have this, and I don't want to take another shower with a shower head ever because it's that good. Um, and then every time you open our box, you have this really cool statement about, "Hey, we're out to make every drop of water sacred." And Lake Mead um, and things that are, you know, coming down uh, with water, we'll we'll change that up. So, um, so that's a little insight into the future with what's happening here in Montrose. Um, last but not least, uh, I will tell you a little bit about our events division. So this is a picture of us at an event, and we came up with this really cool shower trailer that's really tiny and small, and it unfolds into these six stalls, and allows people to get clean using the compressed cellulose sponge. Each one gets, each person gets their own sponge, and um, this gives you kind of like, like an idea of how small it is when it's collapsed. We can actually put two of them in the back of a flatbed trailer, and that's what we do for large events. And then when we show up at an event, um, yeah, this is what it looks like unfolded. And what's really great is um, we have like a whole uh, experience when people walk in a little skeptical. They're like, really, 20 gallons of water? And then they walk out and they're like, I can't believe what just happened. You know, like their minds are absolutely blown. They're like, I only used half of it. And I'm like, I know. 
<laughs> what's cool is it? So, uh, so what ends up happening as a result of thousands of people coming through is number one, a lot of them end up buying the geyser. So, but number two, their their imagination just just like goes out beyond like I can't, like what else is now possible with this and. Um, and what's really fun about this is that people go back to their campsite and they're talking about it with their friends. Like, you have to experience this. And so what happens is you got like thousands of people who are now like talking about geyser and what's happening in Montrose. So, and I'm not just saying that actually. Like we, two weekends ago, were at Rocky Grass, so in Lyons, Colorado, and uh, a lot of people were like, oh, Montrose, yeah, there's a lot of cool things happening there. And, uh, I was just really happy and surprised to hear that. Like, fire department is the fact they're like, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, no. Um, any rate, and then we have a um, defense side for the sake of time. I think, Kathy, I'll just skip this part, but this is a new and upcoming development that we're really excited and hopeful to get launched really soon. Um, we're just awaiting for the military to come out with some requirements. and. Uh, will be providing them a proposal. And should this unfold, lights out. <laughs> we're putting we're putting a lot of food on a lot of tables in this town. And most importantly, like what I've learned is uh, there's a lot of men and women today who are coming back from the field with some major hygiene issues. And when we talk about the mental health of a lot of people, um, especially men and women in uniform who are going through some really stressful conditions. Man, I mean, can you imagine what a shower could do after not showering for weeks? Gives you a little bit more dignity. <coughs> hot shower, warm bed, and hot meal. If there could be a cold beer, that'd be really good to give them too, but I mean, I, told, I tell them, like, I can't give you guys a cold beer, but I can give you guys a hot shower, so that's what I'm up to. And uh, yeah, I mean, long term, I mean, we just want to be a big growing part of Montrose, and um, I'll tell you guys what's coming up in the future. So, as you can probably imagine, with this level of expansion, we will need more capital. And so if there's anybody out there who's interested in investing, I'm giving everyone here an open invitation um, to consider us. Um, I can tell you more. If you would like to invest not only in this community, but also in this company, then we can talk more about that. As some of you may not be in a position to invest because you're not regarded as an accredited investor, we're currently uh, undergoing a review process with Start Engine one of our country's largest platforms for not accredited uh, people. So any anybody can invest in a smaller company like us. Um, so we'll find out, um, hopefully by the end of next week, whether we're one of the few companies that go through that platform. Um, so yeah, and that's all I've got. Thank you. So what we'll do now is open it up for questions. Audrey and Jonathan will both be up there. So address your question to whomever. If, you, if it fits both of them, that's fine. And for those of you who are new, you just need to raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic. The reason we use the mic is this is being filmed and they need to be able to hear what's going on. So, first question. <laughs> uh, Jonathan and Audrey, thank you very much for your presentation. And even more, thank you for choosing Montrose uh, yes. for your presentation. <laughs> I, I love small businesses and I love entrepreneurs and, and so forth. And I started a small business myself, and and, uh, and one of the things I noticed that I noted that it was really incredible to have a, a small business or a business plan to, to operate by. And uh, I really wish I could have done some of the things that you guys did, you know, traveling around and skiing and 
ski bumming and everything else, but nowhere in there did I, I hear the, the three letters MBA. Oh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, a business plan is really an important part of starting a business, and, and I'd like to know how you developed your business plan, uh, and also what was the greatest challenge you had after you had that business plan put together? <laughs> um, yeah, and for somebody who's really creative and innovative, um, I can probably say like planning is not necessarily the most strong suit or most like, because you're in a mode of discovery. You're stepping into something that is unknown. Like you don't know what you don't know when you have these conversations and you tell people, you, you, can you imagine coming up to a person who's like, hey, I got this product I'd like for you to test. Okay, well that's already uncomfortable. It's a sponge bath on steroids. <laughs> you know, or like, it's an astronaut shower. Like, you don't even know like the word. We're still trying to figure out like, how do you describe this to somebody? But, but like, there's a, like the question is like, where is the value of a plan? And I'll tell you, like there's, there is a lot of value. So, um, so you have like this other extreme side of like, okay, you got a creative side, but you got to have a little bit of structure around the conversation. And uh, yeah, so uh, I, I don't, a lot of people who know me would tell you that I don't necessarily brag about like my background. So with a little bit of permission is all right if I share with you guys a little bit about what I've accomplished. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yes. come from a top 10 MBA program or a top 10 engineering program. So um, industrial engineering, aerospace engineering, mathematician, um, and then I got accepted into UT's MBA program, which was top tier, really rigorous, really tough. Um, straight out of college, I was managing Dell Computer's bottleneck of their top manufacturing plant. So I was in the morning shift, 23,000 computers a day. That was a lot. It was a pressure cooker straight out of college, and then I haven't stopped since. So I, I like really hard things. I like really tough responsibilities and challenges, and I love bringing a group of people together and make great things happen. To do that, you have to effectively communicate. And what I've learned is that MBAs do a good job giving you the frameworks to get everybody on the same page. And um, I was also left a little frustrated with like the limitations that come with that communication style. Like, There's a lot of things that MBA school taught me that left me think, feeling like some of it sounds like just I'm here just to sound good, or I'm here just to look good. And so I don't feel like that was the most authentic expression. Having said that, um, in the accelerator program, finding a way to test a business model and make sure that you double down on that business model was a big component of what we did, and I'm really grateful because they showed me how to sprint through and create the business models around a good product. And a lot of that was discovered and then from there, we could have at least one foothold and come up with a plan and a strategy around that. So, I mean, for us, the plan was really simple. Take care of REI, no matter what. They were a tremendous partner with us, and there's a lot of retailers that are, are their caliber and size that don't give the small businesses like a day of their time. REI gave us a chance of a lifetime, and so from there, we just established ourselves with that. We learned a lot from that, and then from that, we can create a solid plan. So the plan um, has been about having a limited amount of international reach, taking care of REI, growing from that into other retailers, showing and proving to other large retailers that we can take care of a larger big box store, and then, um, and then from there, looking at what what our current product does, learn from the limitations of that product, and then come up with new products. Like something in the military that I did not share is that the learnings of that technology that we currently have make available a whole new story in terms of energy consumption. We have a design that is a pump that does not operate off of 12 volts. We have now a design that operates off of a five volt USB jack, a pump that fits in the palm of your hand. You can ship that anywhere it's less than $12 to produce here in the United States. Done. So, and how do you plan around that? Well, that's a good one. 
I mean, we actually been sent by the state of Colorado to Mexico City. I took the prototype of that product out there to East Avalaba, one of those regions that do not have water infrastructure. You have to have a water truck out to them. You have to water truck, you have to take a water truck out to their neighborhood and then they pour water into their body on buckets and carry it all home. So, uh, so we have consultants that have created a game plan and uh, plan around what does that look like at a global level. And then from there, once we prove Mexico City, then we go to Lagos, Nigeria. Then we go to Bangalore. Then we go to other places. Um, so there is there is a plan. Um, obviously, it takes a whole lot of capital, and it also takes a little bit of a dance with the external circumstances. Of which, if you ask me to create a plan, and oh by the way, that plan was going to be around a worldwide pandemic, and the plan was going to be around interest rates at this at this kind of rate. And your your investors were going to freak out because all of their technology side of their portfolio is now gone to trash because of AI and tens of thousands of layoffs in the tech industry. Like, I would have had to rewrite that plan ten different times, and each time just throw it away after the next week. So, um, having said that, now it's a little bit easier to create a plan. Because we're established, we know what we're doing. We have an established brand. We have tested a certain co couple of segments and markets, and we we know where we're going to win and where we're not. We also know where is our greatest return of investment in terms of marketing spend and what we have not done. So, for example, Burning Man, it costs five dollars to take care of one gallon of water. You know, some people are paying upwards of twenty dollars for a gallon of water just to get it up to their camp and then getting it taken out because you cannot have water left around in the desert. You would think that that's a great place for them to save money. That's a really tough segment to approach. <laughs> and we've actually taken care of a camp for 150 people and saved them $45,000 of water at one Burning Man camp. So I mean, we came in like, hey, we're proven. We're even, we speak your language. We're part of your tribe, you know? So there's a lot of surprises where we're like, hey, this was the plan. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, did that answer your question? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cheers, thank you. Next question is here. I had, I had two there. Yeah. Okay. One That's for each, um, to be fair. I went to a mediocre school and got a degree in geology. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew more about business. Um, I made a business plan before we started. Uh, you might laugh at it. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to know the cost of equipment that there's no equipment available of um, creating it. So um, it certainly has cost a lot more to build and create uh, the farm and the equipment than planned. Um, like he said, the pandemic and the ever-changing weather is a huge factor. You never, it's really hard to create a plan where you don't know what your sales are gonna be. I have zero, I can't, there's zero information to say what, how much money I'm gonna make next month or next year. Like the breweries are all over the place right now, beer sales are not stable, um, and, and so it's really hard to know what expenses can be when you have no guess of what income's going to be. So that's really difficult. Um, I almost every day wish I knew more about business. There's some situation with a brewer or, or whatever, a, a somebody else that I don't know what the best decision to do is. And, and we just, you know, do the best we can and, um, and move forward. Um, there's not nearly as much business involved as, as his, um, but uh, it's, it's tough, I would say, from my, my perspective. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my question to both of you is, uh, as I'd like to hear briefly as to uh, your relationship with the environment and being stewards of the land. So it's great to conserve water, but from a watershed perspective, are we looking at, you know, you use the term overlanding industry. I'm a little leery about uh, responsible travel management, making sure that people are not using less water, but also not trashing, staying on the trail and playing by the rules. So just being committed to our environmental uh, ecosystem health. Um, yeah, one thing that we thought when we decided to go into farming was that 
it's it's only a small amount, but it is a small amount of land that is not going to go into subdivision or concrete or whatever. Um, and and in that way, we could keep that space green. Not to mention whatever three. I forget the number now. A lot of carbon that we um, help uh, with. Uh, also, I think if all the farms are in the Pacific Northwest for hops, and having something in a different area and shipping, that's a huge selling, selling point for us, is the carbon emissions of shipping from us to Denver or us to Texas, or you know, we have a lot of big buyers in Phoenix and, and Albuquerque in Texas as well, and that carbon footprint is significantly lower than coming from Washington State. Um, so that's important. We have a drip irrigation system. Um, thank you to the NRCS, which is part of the USDA. Um, a huge project they have in keeping um, salts and different minerals going into uh, the Colorado River that are killing chub and other fish downstream. And so um, it makes a lot of sense for our, us from a farming standpoint, but then it, I mean, we use a fraction of our water that we are allocated our shares versus um, flood irrigation and we are we're working on doing more solar it's really expensive um, and it's really hard for a small business there are a lot of uh, grants that we're sort of working through um, they are always changing with the government but um, trying to get more efficient with our energy is is on the list um, and yeah that's that's the short and skinny of everything <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, that question puts me in the position to speak on behalf of the Overland community. And uh, for those of you who do not know what Overland is, it's essentially like, you know those Toyota Tacomas with the rooftop tent, and if you look in the back, you can have a slide out kitchen, and it's like glamping to the huge extreme where you can be out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so on behalf of the Overland community, um, is, which is a community I'm really proud about, um, we are really, really clear about not being off the trail and not making or leaving behind a mess. So don't leave a trace behind. And one of the reasons why we became a title sponsor of the largest overlanding events in the country is because of what we make possible with minimizing runoff and things that are happening as a result of people going out and camping. Overlanding is distinct from four-wheeling. Four-wheeling does have a tendency <clears throat> to blaze their own trail, and so that's very different and distinct for rock climbing. And um, I will say that, uh, that <clears throat> I learned over time that there's a couple of different smaller tribes that are really into uh, rock crawling. Overlanding is not about that. So, um, we don't participate in those kind of conversations, and um, we're not a part of those communities that are participating in, in that kind of treatment of, their, of our environment. So, um, so yeah, uh, I would say that overlanding is, uh, is built around people just having the love and enthusiasm for the great outdoors and doing their favorite activities outdoors, but doing that in a very respectful manner. and. Uh, I think if you come over to an Overland Expo show where you're going to see tens of thousands of Overlanders coming together and talk, talking about ideas, you're going, to, you're going to see and witness behaviors that are consistent with their love for the environment. So yeah, and I think it's uh, something that we can all be really proud about. Thank you. I'm very impressed with these heady questions and the responses. It's fantastic. Uh, I am a small grower, so mine is more simplistic. Uh, on Audrey, on your harvesting of the hops, what's that process take place? I've been fascinated watching your development out there. Uh, thanks. Um, so hops grow 18 feet tall. The trellis is, is 18 feet tall. Um, just to backtrack a little, in the spring is stringing and training, and so we go through and we tie roughly 60,000 uh, coconut core uh, strings to the top wire. Um, that's another specially made uh, wagon. 
to get people up there, hand tie every one of those strings, and then a crew comes in and clips them into the plant. Uh, every plant gets two strings. Then you go around to every uh, string and you wrap three to four binds around that, picking the strongest, healthiest ones to grow up. Um, so now you have this string with plant grown up around it, and as they've gotten arms, produce cones. So when harvest comes, uh, we go through with a machete and you cut the bottoms of the plants. Um, so now they're, we'll kind of just do one row at a time. They're hanging from that trellis, looks like a ghost, just sort of hanging there. And then we go through with the tractor and trailer and um, on the back side of the trailer is another man basket. And so we'll go through where the hanging hops kind of go into the trailer and then um, the person is macheting the top of that plant. And so now we have an entire row, um, ideally uh, laid out straight, we don't want a big rat's nest, um, of these 18 foot long plants. Um, come back into the warehouse, um, there's a hydraulic um, kind of conveyor on that trailer, so then we dump that pile of plants next to the picker. Um, and the picker, I'm pretty sure Dr. Seuss made it because there was like a million moving parts and chains and belts and fans. Um, and it's so, I don't know, 16 feet tall, 20 feet long, 10 feet wide, big box, and there's a feeding arm out front. And so you take an individual plant at the bottom and you kind of hook it in, a clip comes around, feeds it through the top of this machine, that has fingers and fans that separate the cones from the vine. The waste is chopped up out the back, um, goes uh, out to a waste conveyor that goes to a, a mulch pile. Then the hops come out a separate conveyor that go up a big conveyor to this dryer. Um, the dryer is four different levels of louvered floors with forced hot air coming up through them. Uh, so we'll drop them from layer to layer as more go in the top. The bottom is a drawer that you then pull that drawer out to a hopper, um, <laughs> drop them into the hopper. There's a conveyor that takes them into the warehouse. From there, um, we have the warehouse floors clean, totally clean before, and we spread them out on the floor and condition them for about 24 hours. The center um, piece of the hop cone can hold more moisture than the petals of it, and so it's important to let it think about itself, make sure that moisture content is where it is, because if you bail it and you have you know, a spot that's at 12%, it's gonna end up spreading and rot your whole bale. Um, so once there, we feel confident about their moisture, then we, um, it's just a handmade hydraulic baler that puts them in a two foot by two foot by four foot bale. They're roughly 120 pound um, bales each, and then that goes into cold storage. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, and from there, uh, we'll get the whole field in, into cold storage. From there, then we open all the bales back up, hand feed them into a hammer mill that, um, that then goes into uh, sort of like a silo um, that feeds into the pellet dye. From the pellet dye, there's a cooling drum, a cooling conveyor belt, and they go onto tarps onto the, um, onto the concrete floor and cool. And then we shovel them up into wheelbarrows and hand, um, hand scoop. So hops are sold in 11 pound bags, which is five kilograms, um, how that came about. So everything gets um, nitrogen purge, vacuum seal in mylar bags um, in 11 pound increments. And last year we did over 30,000 pounds. So that's a lot, of, a lot of measuring 11 pound bags and vacuum sealing them. Um, and then they, those bags go into cold storage again, and that's what we sell. Um, and we do, um, harvest is going on right now, and at noon today, I have some folks coming out for a, a tour. Um, so we do offer tours if anybody's interested in coming and checking it out. Um, yeah. Wow, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Just hearing that. What interesting presentations. We didn't begin to cover all the questions. We do have the Police Academy coming in.